The world of biological products is expanding, often with a focus on insects and disease pests. But now there's news of a biological weed control product. Welcome to Around Farm Progress, a podcast that looks at agriculture issues across the country. I'm Willie Vogt, your host and editorial director for Farm Progress. The biological market has been expanding rapidly and many major crop protection companies are adding products with a bio-based history to their portfolios. Most of those are fungicides and insecticides, but what about weed control? We found a company exploring that technology too. Harp Bioherbicide Solutions has identified a compound that works as a non-selective herbicide and it can be paired with legacy products for even greater results. We caught up with Bill Buckner, CEO, and Chad Brommer, co-founder and chief technology officer, to discuss the tech. And by the way, Buckner had retired when he was tapped for this new job, and he shares that story, too. Bill and Chad, thanks for joining me on Around Farm Progress. I wanted to talk to you about something pretty exciting you guys have at Heart Bioherbicides, and that's the concept of a biological approach to controlling weeds. I mean, we hear about biologicals for disease and insects. But you've crossed a threshold into an area that I'm not sure anybody else is really doing yet. Chad, do you want to tell me a little bit about what you've created? And what's going on there? Sure. Well, and, and thanks for having us. It's, a, it's a <clears throat> quite exciting for us, too, to be a part of this. Well, what we wanted to do from the beginning was find some products, some pathways that we could develop herbicides, which would come from natural sources. So that could be a natural chemical. It could be a natural enzyme. And what we found after, you know, doing quite a bit of work was that we could get some plant extracts and that could be the biological basis for our herbicides. And so that starts us down a long path of development and screening what type of products can we use, you know, that can be registrable as well as highly effective and going through the different iterations and formulations. And that leads us kind of to where we are today is where we've got series of products that we we feel are very close to being deployable in terms of putting out in the market either for organic use which is oftentimes not something that you talk about with a herbicide that you're focusing in on true production row crop agriculture but because they're plant extracts we can formulate these and, and put the products together so that they are omri or organic certified and so now, you know, it's almost like having two platforms in one where each of our products are different in terms of the extracts and the formulations. And some can be organic certified and some can be ready for your number two dent corn that's going out in the field. Hmm. So the farmer listening to this is going to say, fine, that sounds really cool. Plants killing weeds. What are we what are we active on or what's how does this work? Is this a targeted to broadleaves or grasses, or is it a, a total like control product? Well, we, we would characterize this as a, as a contact with, with some translocation total control product. So not terribly different than when you think of glufosinate or Liberty, but instead of those being synthesized molecules that were discovered in a screening platform, you know, we, we got these from nature. And in a lot of ways, Nature is sometimes the best arbiter for some of these products. I mean, plants are fighting each other all the time. Uh, We just listened in on them a little bit and were able to put some of these pieces together. The crop protection industry has a long history of finding at least base ideas from plants. Obviously, pyrethroids came from Mm -hmm. mums and even more recently, mesotrione started in, in as a as a natural chemical, but it was a, it's a synthetic, so I don't want to confuse anybody there. So the idea has always been out there, but you've taken this a little farther. You're not you're this is a real plant extract. You haven't synthesized a synthetic version of a plant extract, right? This is the actual plant extract. Yeah, that, that's correct. And it, it's not to say that we cannot or are not going beyond that. But again, the, the goal was to, to find some products that were highly effective, that were affordable, that pair well with other herbicides in the market so you can put your tank mix, your premix together well, and be able to control weeds both post-emergent, and in our case, we can alter the formulation so that we have a highly effective pre-emergent or soil active product. Uh, Is that because of the additives? I mean, the carriers that are in it that make it 
different or because the, the active ingredient is still the same, right? It's just the carriers or how does that change from pre-emerge to post-emerge? Well, we, we have a series of different plants that we use for our extracts and each plant, you know, we, we can think of as because they're raw extracts, we're sort of squeezing the juice out. Each one has its different set of active molecules that are in it, as well as a whole series that are not active in terms of herbicidal or, or, or plant weed control. Okay. So by having this a basket of molecules that we can draw from, it's it's truly no different than a crop protection company now saying that we have 15 chemicals that we manufacture and make. How can we put them together into a formulation that's effective for pre-emergence in corn or effective for post-emergence in soybeans? We're really taking the same approach that a corporation would, but we're doing it with these known sets of molecules that just come from a plant and not from a synthesis facility. I want to get back to that, but I want to talk to Bill a little bit. Bill, you've got a history in, in crop protection. You were at Bayer for quite a while. Then you went then you went left there and went to the Noble Foundation, did work in soil health. And then you retired and you're sitting there on your porch thinking about things and maybe doing some board work and consulting. And along comes this this gang from, you know, from Harp here. What why did you think you should be a part of this? Tell me about that a little bit. Well, they, at the point of contact that I had was with a gentleman by the name of Aiden Conley, who was, they led our seed investing round. And Aiden was looking for funds. And so he gave me a call and indicated that he has these guys that have developed this bioherbicide. And he described it as the uh, organic version of Roundup. Hmm. So obviously when you hear something like that, it piques your ears. And, and so, you know, I, I'm from Missouri originally, the show me state. So I said, well, Chad's gonna have to come out and show me. So Dr. Brummer came up to my farm here in North Carolina and uh, and he sprayed some weeds for me, some some really tough ones and it was highly effective and, and uh, the efficacy was was amazing and the time to kill was was amazing. So I said, well, let's let's talk about this and what you guys really wanna do with the product in your company. And uh, Chad has, was graduating out of the formulation stage in his kitchen and looking around for some professional formulators <laughs> in the country. And so I leaned back on a lot of my connections in the industry and kind of we put together a pathway of, of development, both from a field trial and field development perspective, but also market development perspective. And, and, uh, and really, we had the same goal in mind, which was not to build a company to launch a product and hire a bunch of sales reps and go on knocking on farmers doors we think the distribution model that's available today in the world is the best place to be so our intent and purpose is to develop the product just as we would have done in basf or buyer and bring this to the global multinationals or strategics if you will and actually divest the asset to them but we're we're doing it in our capacity and 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 what we want to see, and we're bringing them in into and we have a series of collaboration agreements with several of them that are ongoing, and so we'll continue to move the product through this these different phases. But uh, one thing about it, uh, Willie, if I was back in Bear and had the opportunity to review this this project from our development people, I'd be giving it two thumbs up at this stage just to keep going and investing. And uh, it's really got a, a strong place in global agriculture, both the organic and the conventional side. So I'm just thrilled to, to death to be working with Daniel and Chad in this endeavor. Well, that's great. And it, it is exciting, as I said at the beginning. But I want to, I guess the question I'm going to ask is what plants, what extracts? I mean, that's pretty, pretty quiet on the documents I saw. Can you tell me what plants you're working with in, in this botanical herbicide? I guess would be the best way to put it. Go ahead, Chad. Oh, can we talk? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So there's our, our focus is on menthus species, although we do have other ones that we don't necessarily talk about. Right. So the, the unique thing about that is mentha is mint. And there's I forget how many different varieties that are out there around the world, and they all produce a, a unique different set of active molecules. Mm -hmm. And just so happens that those active molecules are excellent at you know, broad spectrum control of lots of different weeds, be it grasses and sedges and broadleaves. But as we started to do some of our work in the field, we noticed that we were doing a very good job on herbicide resistant weeds. 
And that all makes sense because what we're putting together is a set of molecules and formulations that there there is no known, at least as far as we have been able to, to find, no resistance that's out there for these products. And so it's really, you know, new sites and modes of action that we can put together in our formulation, pairing with existing products if we want to, in order to get, you know, a really effective, fast set of weed control. Can you characterize the mode of action? I mean, you know, we talk about our, you know, PPDs, HPPDs and PPOs and sulfonylureas. Can you characterize the action in this product? Because it's not just one molecule doing the work, right? Yeah, it, it can be a little challenging to, to piece together what everything is doing in these raw extracts. But what we do know from some of our work and, and some other work that we've gleaned from, from other sources is what we're doing is we're solubilizing, making the, the membranes a little more loose. Oh. And by doing that, it starts to cause a series of cascades of problems inside the plant cell. And that's then we start to get into something similar to an HPPD action or a PPO action where we're building up free radicals, we're building up oxygenated species, the plants lose turgor pressure, wilt really fast, mm -hmm. and then they start to turn to brown as the chlorophyll can't be regenerated, and then they turn to black as the, the tissue degrades. Oh, that's pretty exciting. And then I would assume in the process of manufacturing this, you concentrate those those molecules. It's not just the pure out of the field that you are you you can ramp up the horsepower. Well, you, the raw extracts are you know we're following the same process that the the different people who grow mint globally okay. extract their molecules from the plant, and those that is the raw extract at the stage that we're using. So it's, it is concentrated in that we're not just you know, squeezing it out of one leaf, but we have not doubled down in terms of on that type of concentration yet. Okay. At least that, in the that, products that we're currently we're currently screening, well, and, and I think that lends itself to some of the excitement from our side as we have a product that we feel is highly effective. It works on herbicide resistant weeds. It works on broadleafs and grasses, which is great. We also get our soil activity, depending on how we put our formulations together. And we're taking the successive steps from the raw extract to continue to drill into what would the, the stripped down version look like, just the effective molecule or molecules that we want to use. We've got some really exciting things. We've got products that we mentioned that are very close to being marketable products. And we're only really in the first couple of stages of this in terms of how far we can go with it in order to, to continue to build it out. Good, I'm thinking of a farmer right now who's listening to this and wondering about it, but this stuff works in my traditional sprayer, right? I can mix it, It's a since it's a plant extract, it's not a living product, it's not a bacteria mm -hmm. or a fungus I need to keep alive, it's a chemical, right? So I can mm -hmm. mix it with other chemicals and I don't have to worry about that, I can just go out and spray. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, the great ways to relate this when I went home this summer to visit my family, I had some of the product shipped up to Iowa, and then we ran around with our pump-up sprayer and sprayed heart by itself, and then we also mixed it with some other products to take care of all the weeds around some of our, our buildings, and it worked great. I mean, it, it's working in a pump sprayer. It was shipped there. It sat in the garage for a week. Uh, you know, th there's nothing fancy or special that we have to do to package formulate or ship these products. And and that's great because it is really difficult when you're working with things that need to be alive. Well, and the formulation is extremely compatible with other synthetic chemistries, so there's no clogged nozzles. It just it just really works well together. Well, and I think that's important because obviously people worry about that when they get some of these things. And when we talk about botanical or biological control of her as a herbicide, that's a future thing, right? I mean, We've, we've done the chemical thing. We've done the synthetics. We're looking forward at biologicals. How do you look at this stuff five, 10 years down the road? How is HARP looking at this going forward? Well, we, we are using the molecules. So there's nothing fancy or the, the foo-foo juice that people would talk about. You know, different biologicals would come out. And, you know, it's, I'm not saying that they weren't effective in some way, but, you know, part of the deal is it has to be consistent. If I choose to pay for this product, I want to know within a certain parameter, it's going to work. If I apply it right in the right conditions, again, not at midnight on one foot, you know, with your sprayer on two wheels instead of four, 
you know, it, it has to work, uh, you know, throughout the growing season. And as, as Bill mentioned, you know, that it really formulates well and pairs well with the whole series of the top 10 chemistries that are currently used for herbicide control. And that's essential. I mean, that's really the table stakes that, that we often talk about. If, if it doesn't formulate well, if it's clogging nozzles, we have all these other issues, then it's not effective. And so we, we're fortunate we've got an excellent group that we're working with in Georgia, CJB Technologies, to help us take the next several steps in formulations and formulating. This is a pretty active product, right? I'm thinking about some new sprayer technologies. We're getting targeted sprays. When we look at pulse width modulation on any sprayer, we want the the chemicals to be good. We're also looking, and I think we've talked before about drone spraying with Rantizo, and there's other companies out there that are building this. Is this a highly concentrated product? So maybe a couple of liters in a drone will get the job done versus, you know, 30, 40 gallons? Or how do you look at that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's a contact product. We do want to get spread across the leaves. There, there, there are ways for us to help enhance that with lower volumes. And I, maybe a good way to think about this is ultra low volume products that have been used either in airplanes or other things, which don't, you know, we don't have to have water as our carrier, although we certainly can. So HARP fits really well because it is concentrated and we can put that into the drone that has, I think the drones we used last year, and hopefully I'm not misstating this, but I think they were five to 10 gallons yeah, that's that they were taking. Right. And now I know Rantizo has moved up. They've got some new FAA certifications. I think they have 30 gallons. So for, for us, that's actually very exciting because we can concentrate the product. We can pair it with some other chemistry that maybe is a, a few grams per acre or a few ounces per acre rather than, you know, kilograms. And now you've got a product you can fly over with a drone that you could spot spray, that you could broadcast spray, be highly effective with again, multiple modes of action and, and control your weeds. And the the sea and spray technology or the pulse width, that's the other part of this that is also really exciting. So if you think about the 10 to 20 gallons per acre that someone's currently spraying, it's a, it's a pretty sufficient you know, high water volume. Well, if we, we only need to spray a few spots where the weeds are coming up post-emergent, now we can put harp in the tank and instead of just going over, you know, the, the 10 acres you might be able to get, now you can go over 50. And HARP is going to be highly effective. It's going to work quite well in that solution. And, it, and it's one of those things we, we mentioned, we're looking towards the next five to 10 years. That's some of the work that we're doing, is that we're actively looking at how will this work in a, in a pulse width system, in a spot spray system. That's why Rentizo has been a, a great cooperator with us doing those tests. What do we see? What are some of the issues? How do we work around that? How do we create a formulation that could be specific for emergency weed control. You have escapes in your bean field. Can you really drive through there and spray it? Do you need to get a crew to hack it out? Can I get Rantizo to fly it for me? You know, that's what people, I, from our perception, that's what growers are looking for, is that I'm gonna continue to have escapes and problems. There's resistance is gonna to continue to develop until we use something like HARP to help knock it back. Well, and then if you have the other side of that story, and I mean, Bill, you probably concur with this. Yes, we're going to get the resistant weeds, but by the way, it's a botanical, it's a biological, it's, you know, that there's a story farmers can tell us as they keep ramping up their sustainability message, right? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, all the way from the production of mint and, and building this circular economy, so to speak, because you harvest the mint, you distill the leaves, and, and then you, it goes right back on the field. So, Farmers that are growing mint can also turn around and use the mint. And so there's there's there is a lot of soil health benefits that go along with that. And then as CPG type companies, your big food companies are demanding farmers to be more accountable for the types of pesticides that they use. Nothing fits better than HARP. You can reduce the amount of synthetics you're using or or use HARP alone to, to really achieve those different types of goals that are, that are being established. Do we have to have more mint? I mean, or can I get mint first and then your product? But how? But I'm with regard to production, Bill. How does that yeah. look? We we've, we've got some work to do there on a global supply chain, and we've taken the, the necessary steps to reach out and and begin to understand a little bit more about mint production in India with smallholder farmers. There's hundreds, thousands of farmers over there growing mint, 
and how do we coordinate that? But there, fortunately, there are groups that are already working with that supply chain in India. So it's a matter of of extracting more oil, so building up the agronomic traits of of mint, but then also increasing the number of acres. And so we we do know that we have to expand the acres of mint, and it's a it's a growing opportunity for producers in North America as well. So. The Mint Industry Research Council, located in in Salem, Oregon, has been a big resource for us. There's an effort to expand acres in in Canada, Western Canada as well. So we we're really looking for for big things from from this perspective. Well, and, and Chad, you mentioned that they're without saying what they are, you're looking at other plant extracts too. I mean, Mint's just a starting point, right? You found some other things. Y- yes. Yeah. Yeah. And. I think what we often get when we sort of introduce the products and, and what they can do in the time lapse and all those things that, that people are really fascinated by is they make the assumption that it's one product or it's one thing and we just dump other things into it, other herbicides, if you will. But the fact is, is that it really is a platform. And, and we view that because we're looking at a series of different types of plant extracts that have molecules and in series of molecules that we've identified that are herbicidally active that we know we can utilize. And what that allows us to do then is if, if I want to tailor something for the golf course, we can tailor something that has less impact, let's say on a, on a grass, something that could replace pendimethalin if you needed to, the, you know, the yellow. Not that mm-hmm. we're trying to do that necessarily, but, but that's an example of how we can develop a product that's specific for that type of market. And then at the same time, we have the product, a similar product that Bill used on his farm that would be considered a, a pre-plant burn down or a version of that as a pre-harvest desiccation product in your cotton, in your in your wheat, you know, in, or in potatoes that's, you know, driven by plant extracts. So you have a completely different re-entry period. You have a completely different, you know, pre-harvest period where you're not waiting. And there's a couple of products in the market now that I know that they're pushing very hard globally to to remove that have been essential for desiccation and things of that nature. So we feel like that's just one example of where, you know, we're developing products, different products that can fit into those different markets throughout the world. That's a pretty big, I mean, based on this, you always worry about a product that promises to do many things in many areas, but a non a contact herbicide that's a non-specific or non-selective a contact herbicide that is perfect for harvest aid as well as weed control and bare weed control and all that this is pretty exciting i like to remind people that nature makes really powerful chemicals you're just finding a way to put them to work in a good thing in a good way right yeah and and it's not just you know one product or one right. set of these extracts and and that's the part yeah, it sounds like we're promising things that you can never truly deliver. <laughs> and, you know, that's really not the case because one of our products we are not ever expecting to deploy across all these different use patterns. That's why we've got a series of products that we're building with CJB right now that we'll be screening this year to fit these different markets that have that are different formulations in order to meet the needs of those different areas. So we, you know, think of it less about we have a product called HARP that does all these things and think about more that we have this package of different compounds, like when they were developing the midazolinones or the sulfonylureas Mm -hmm. or the HPPD and PPO products. Now there's this whole, you know, series of molecules that all work in sort of the same way, but you, but they have different tolerances in plants and they have different, you know, the degradation paths in the environment. And so we can put all those together and think more like a company would. How do we get not a product, but a series of products based on these core technologies that can be used in different different use patterns? Well, that's exciting. And obviously, if it doesn't work somewhere, you're not going to succeed. So you're not going to deploy it where it doesn't work. Pretty sure Bill wouldn't think that's a good idea or any of the rest of your board. But that's, that's for sure. We, <laughs> we have a pretty high bar. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, looking at your board, board, I agree. I know some of those guys. So that's really good. So Bill and Chad, I thank you for your time here on Around Farm Progress and helping us explain a botanical herbicide. I'm very excited about this. Thanks very much. 
Thank you, Willie. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is exciting technology, putting a plant extract to work to kill weeds. We thank Bill Buckner and Chad Brommer from Harp Bioherbicide Solutions for their insights on the new product and how it might be deployed in the market. And of course, you may never look at mint plants the same way again. Farm Progress is the nation's leading agriculture information source with 17 state and regional brands, as well as Farm Futures, Beef, National Hog Farmer and Feedstuffs, and our events, including the Farm Progress Show, Husker Harvest Days, and the New York Farm Show. And there's another opportunity for staying connected to Farm Progress using your smartphone. If you text FARM to 20505, you can sign up for the Farm Progress mobile text service. When you send that first message, you'll get a confirmation, so be sure to respond to that too to get on the list. You can eventually be part of the Farm Progress panel to share your insights with our regular polls. Sign up today. Join us next week as we continue our agriculture journey around the country. I'm Willie Vogt, Editorial Director at Farm Progress. Thanks for listening.